All right, let's uh, open our Bibles to Romans 12 as you make your way back. Romans chapter 12. And we are in the the application part of of the letter, and uh, we're going to be looking at a series of of brief exhortations that follow up, uh, I think, the the initial exhortation that we looked at last time in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. And I don't know if you can uh, be super structured or, or super dogmatic in, in how to outline this. Um, I read a bunch of different commentaries, and some uh, organize it one way, some organize it another way. Uh, no matter what, there's just clearly a, a whole series of very uh, kind of bullet-pointed, just direct, brief exhortations. But if we think about them... They're very encouraging and uh, give us direction. So uh, we're going to pick up and read from verses 9 to verse 13. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, and distributing to the needs of the saints, and given to hospitality. Father, we pray that you will help us as we consider uh, this part of Paul's exhortation, Paul's encouragement to the believers, that you would speak to us, that you would give us insight into our own lives, that you would help us not to make excuses, but Lord, the opposite of an excuse, Lord. We pray you'd help us to recognize opportunities Help us, Lord, even as we uh, are at a holiday season tomorrow, Thanksgiving, and going into the Christmas season, and and having opportunities to be around people, Lord, that uh, maybe we only see during the holidays. We we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to us, that we would have um, an energy from him, a strength from him, a power from him to to really walk in, in that which would bring you glory. And, and may you help, help us, Lord, as we consider these phrases, help them to come alive in our hearts and in our minds, that we would see the possibilities uh, that are right there for us, Lord, what your Spirit is doing in our lives, that we'd be able to yield to him completely and walk in the Spirit and have a victory over the flesh and, and bring you glory as we, as we love one another. So help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I don't want to spend so much time on each one of these studies because we've already covered it, but remember that as we're in these practical exhortations, this section begins in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where he says this is the result of everything that he set up to this point, the big therefore. Since God has done this for us, then present your body to God a sacrifice, living and holy, and it's pleasing to God. So if you want to be pleasing to God, this is how you're pleasing to God. Give God your body a sacrifice, but alive, holy and pleasing to him. That's our response. And then he says, don't be conformed to the world. So the exhortations he's going to give us are going to be not necessarily worldly advice. The world might give you different advice. The world might read through this list and go, that's great. You should do that for me. Uh, Self-centeredness is the, is the rule of the world. So don't be conformed to the world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he's given the exhortation to begin with that we would be giving ourselves to God, and then we would be giving our minds to God to make them new so that we'd be able to see what's pleasing to God. So now we're looking at a list of those things that are pleasing to God, and we want to remember that they're, they're on a foundation, so we're, like if you're building a house, the most important thing when you're building the house is not the drywall. The most important thing is the foundation, <laughs> because you could, have, you could have the most amazing crown molding, you could have done this incredible painting, you could have all this stuff, but if your foundation is messed up, the whole house is going to fall. So uh, those things may be important if the foundation's fine, then everything else can be, you can put a bunch of energy into it, but... Uh, the foundation so key. So the foundation statements are you're giving yourself to God as a sacrifice, 
but you're alive. So this is what this life looks like. You're not, you're not letting some, some worldly mentality capture your mind. Instead, you're having your mind you know, transformed and renewed by the Spirit of God. And so he's going to show us these things. So uh, we looked last time at verse uh, 9, and I, I, I think we could sort of look at this as the, the main statement would be love, and then you could probably think of all of these as expressions of love. Certainly some of them are very directly including the word love, or one of the Greek words for love. But love without hypocrisy, so, so we're not play acting at this. This is something that's for real. God's got a hold of our life. Our heart is changed. The Spirit's living inside of us. And we're being motivated by God in a totally new way. And we're not pretending. Uh, we're actually from the heart, have the fruit of the Spirit, and God's doing a work. Isn't that awesome to think about? So what does that love look like? So the first thing he says is interesting. Uh, Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. I think we'll put those together since they're One's a prohibition and one's a, an encouragement, kind of the two sides of the coin. So the things that are evil, hate those things. And the things that are good, hang on to them. So uh, you could immediately think he's changed the subject because normally we wouldn't think that a, of an appeal to purity, to, to say no to evil or to hate evil, to choose good, to cling to that, that that would somehow have a connection to love. But it actually does. This is a New Testament idea. I think John says it the most clearly in 1 John. If you want to turn over there, turn to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. John says in verse 2, this is a very interesting statement. This isn't all that he says about love. In fact, chapter 4, he says a lot. He says some very significant things in chapter 3. says some significant things in chapter 1. But this is very interesting what he says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. And whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So, he gives us the hope, you're born of God, you overcome the world. If you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. The commandments are not a burden, actually. If you love God, they're going to be what you want to do. But verse 2 is kind of puzzling. This is how we know we love the children of God. You might think that the next part of the sentence would be something like, when you bake them a really wonderful pumpkin cheesecake snack cake for uh, the break. Or when you bring in the senorita bread from the bakery that everybody loves so much. No, when, this is how you know you love the children of God. When, when you come in on a Thursday and you make sure the church is clean for Sunday. Uh, this is how you show that you love the children of God. When you volunteer for a Sunday school class and you prepare your lesson and you're ready and you come early and you make sure your classroom's ready for the kids and you, you're all in. There's a, there's a million ways we could think of you'd finish that. This is how you know that you love the children of God. What are the things that you guys are doing that show that you love the children of God? It's lots of different things. But this is super interesting to me, what he says. This is how we know we love the children of God. It's not what you think. He says, this is how you know if you love God and you keep his commandments. John's asserting in this particular verse, he says more than this in the letter, so I'm not trying to say this is all that he says. It's not. But this is an important thing that he says. And it's very closely related to, I think, our context, what Paul's saying. If you want to show people that you love them, the best way, and I would say the first way, but the very best way is to love God. I can say that honestly from my side of things, for me personally. If you want to show me that you love me, love God. I like that more than cakes. I like that more than doing some nice deed for me. I like that more than writing me a nice note or whatever. Whatever you would think of like, oh, I want to tell Rich. I want Rich to know how much we love him. I want to do this. Listen, for me, I could honestly say I could live without all of those. The one thing that would mean the most to me would be if you love God. And the second part, if you do what he says. This is a really, really interesting thing if you think about it. I remember the first time I read this verse, and thought of it, I think I'd read over it many times and hadn't really thought about it. But one time I was reading this and I, it just struck me and I thought, this is a weird thing to say. This is how we know we love the people of God when we love God. Like, wait, 
Are we talking about the loving the people of God? Yeah, we are. Love God. If you want to love the people around you, the best way for you to show the people around you that you love them is if you love God and do what he says. The best thing you can do for our congregation, if you're part of the church here, the best thing you can do to show love to the congregation is number one, love God and do what he says. And whatever else he tells you to do after that, then do that. If he tells you to bring senorita bread or bake a cake or do whatever it is that he's putting on your heart to do, then do that. But you know, as well as I know, when you have a Christian friend and they're not loving God and they're not doing what God says, it's a bummer. <laughs> it's unloving in a way. that I'm, I don't want to like take it away. I don't want to make a weird thing out of it. But I think it's really important to note that we can show each other that we love each other by doing what God says. And when you have a Christian friend who loves God and does what God says, isn't it great to be around them? <laughs> Isn't it awesome to have them in your life? Isn't it awesome for them to call you and go, hey, I've got some extra time. You want to grab coffee or you want to go for a run on Saturday? You wanna, I want to go check this out. You want to go with me? And you think, yeah. I mean, anything with you is great because you love God and you do what he says. So I think, I think sometimes maybe we, we, we get to the, the next level of things. You know, the, the, the more, I don't know what, simple is not the right word, but the the, uh, the less fundamental things, I mean, cakes are nice, okay, or volunteering for Sunday school class is nice, or all the things that need to get done at the church, or all the ways we give our gifts and love each other. He's, he's already talked about the gifts already. Use your gifts to minister to one another. So we're not taken away from that. But going back here to Romans 12, he says in verse 9, let your love be without hypocrisy. And then the next exhortation is, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So as you're loving the congregation, if you're loving the people in your life, you're loving the people that live on your street or the people that you work with, hating what's evil and clinging to what is good is an expression of love. You know, Jesus made it really clear. John's not inventing what he says in chapter 5 when he says, this is the love of God that you keep his commandments. That's word for word out of the mouth of Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So the the obedience part of love, the, the expressions of our love to God that are, that are given in, in the hunger for the Word of God, the desire for the Word of God, and when God says something, all right, He said it, I'm going for it. And, and a seriousness about it, a diligence about it. We'll have some other verses that we'll talk about that in our list here about diligence. So I don't really think He's moved topics because look at verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Both of those words have the Greek word for love in them. The kindly affectionate is the word phileo, philos, the, the brotherly love, and then the word for family love. Puts them together. It's the only time the word occurs in the whole New Testament. And it doesn't really occur a lot outside of the New Testament. There's a couple of phrases in here that it seems like Paul is sort of, uh, there, there's just not a lot of historical context. It's like Paul is just making words to say what he wants them to say or mean what he wants. Like, it's a Christian meaning that doesn't really exist outside of the Lord. So one of them is verse 10, this kindly affectionate to one another, and then the word brotherly love, where we get the word Philadelphia. The idea, or that's the city of brotherly love, phileo. Love of the brother. Love the brother. Love brotherly like a family. So the let love be without hypocrisy. Then he says, love like a family with brotherly love. <laughs> and what's in between? Hate evil, cling to what's good. So I don't really, like in the context, I don't really want to just pare it away and say, well, he's now giving us a whole list of things that are totally different from each other. I think it's important, especially when John says, this is how we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. It's an important concept to have in our mind. When you think about your responsibility to the people around you, like what can I give to people? I don't have any money. Give them your love of God. Love God. You don't need any money to love God. Do what he says. Love God. Love his word. And when God says something in his word, do it. That's the best way for you to show love. There might be a, a million other ways that God like, adds on top of that. But the best one of all. the most. If, I, if, if you said, Rich, you only get to have one. This is the one I would pick. If you said, all right, I'm going to show you that I love you. I'm going to love God and do what he says. I was like, great. Great, that's all I need. I don't need another birthday card. I don't need... I don't need to remember anything, you know, something, anything. I'm good. I would be so happy with that. And I don't, I'm not saying that as a pastor. 
as a Christian. Right? You've had friends that fell away. Don't you wish they could, like, I, I just wanted to show how much I love you, so I came back to the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm so happy. Right? Isn't it, the, isn't it the most important thing to you? So he's talking about a relationship with each other. So uh, I think hating what's evil, clinging to what is good. So hate evil, the, the Proverbs talk about that. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. A, a recognition of, of uh, what God values, that I'm going to value what God values. I'm going to devalue what God says is evil. I'm going to value and hold on to what God says is good. It's really the renewing of my mind. I've, I've renewed my mind, and I, I can see things for what they are, and that is evil, and I don't have anything to do with it, and this is good, and I'm just going to grab hold of that with all my might. And, and so um, personal holiness, it's the best gift you can give to your friends, the best way you can show love. Cling to what is good. Then verse 10, the next exhortation is, as I already mentioned it, to try to set the context, kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. So this is really a very brief little phrase. Kindly affectionate is one word. There's a couple of connector words in there. But the one another is important. There's also a second one another in this verse. Uh, in honor, giving preference to one another. So these two phrases in verse 10 are definitely about how we're connected to each other. I think the whole list is, obviously, but these actually have the word there, one another. So what do we do with one another? This isn't a one-sided thing. This is reciprocal. It's one to another, right? It's like a tennis match. If the tennis match is reciprocal or it's over really quick, 6-0, 6-0, 6-0, and, you know, Federer won or something, you know, like it's... You, you, you hit it, it gets hit back. So what, this is one to another. This isn't one person's just doing it. This is both people are doing it for each other. Kindly affectionate. This is a word, as I mentioned, that's only one time in the, in the New Testament. It's the word storge, which means family love. The word phalos, which means brotherly love. And he just puts them together. It's as though he's talking about the, the relationship that we have within the body of Christ to him and this passage that he's talking about, either one of those words by themselves is not going to communicate what he's wanting to say. So he puts them two together. Love like brothers with that family love that you, wait. the way you love your aunt, the way you love your brother. Well, maybe you don't love your aunt. I mean, it's, this is Thanksgiving. Some of you are already stressed out about tomorrow, so maybe this is a tough time to have this verse, but that, that kind of, you know, with your family, you just have each other you're, 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 you have so many shared experiences, and there's something you just look forward to if it's not super dysfunctional. Hopefully it's not so bad for you. Uh, but I prefer a pretty dysfunctional family, but I love it when we all get together. I just like to leave before the brawling starts and all the other craziness. But, but I, I sure love my family. And there's some kind of a thing where uh, there's, like a, there's a bond that's unbreakable, and there's is an acceptance. And then there's brotherly love, which is sort of the, the friendship kind of, um, you're loving like brothers and the family and just putting them to, all together in the body, right? In the body of Christ, we're family, but we're also brothers, but we also have God's agape love. It's this wonderful new kind of a thing that happens uh, that is hard to describe. So he's saying, have that for each other. So that family, brotherly love, have it with each other with brotherly love. Sound redundant? It's because it is. Like if you look at it in Greek, you see the philos, philos, and there's actually another uh, use of that word near the end, verse 13. So remember that. So he, he said, let your love be without hypocrisy. Now verse 10, he's saying, have that commitment towards each other. Love is family. Love one another. Love with brotherly love. Now, if you're from a dysfunctional family where you say, does that mean I have to be codependent and passive-aggressive and hold stuff in and then explode at you and then tell my, all my cousins about it and then, no, 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 not the dysfunctional family. Uh, with God's family, God's standard, right? Uh, obeying God's word and following what God said. Have that love for each other. And if you want to know what it would look like, verse 10, I think, is still, I think he's still describing love Verse 10 continues, the next point is in honor, giving preference to one another. 
These words also are difficult to translate. I looked at all my language commentaries and my more technical commentaries, and they didn't agree with each other. But they did a good job of quoting all from back early church fathers all the way till today, and how really nobody really totally knows about this. The Latin Vulgate translates this one way, translated into uh, English in different ways. Uh, and the reason is that um, when he says... In honor, we know what that word means. That's to give someone honor, uh, to give them respect. But when he says giving preference, this word for giving preference has a, a, the idea of, of like a competition and, and sort of defeating your competition. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting thing that, so it, it's, he's using a word that uh, is to the, you, you know he's not saying, hey, compete with people and cry. Like, no, he's, he's using a word of, uh, of, that would imply some kind of a, of a zeal that you had. But instead of a zeal for your own glory, it's you're having a zeal so that someone else will have glory. That's a very really interesting thing to say, to be, to be championing, championing, championing your friends, to be, to be the biggest cheerleader for the, the, the kid who's going off to college in the church or finding a young kid who's discouraged or, or you know, seeing somebody and just believing in them. Uh, encouraging them, giving them honor, recognizing uh, their, uh, you know, their, their value to the Lord. Normally, we're preoccupied with our own value. The natural thing is to say, well, no one even remembered me. They didn't even save me a piece of that wonderful cheesecake, pumpkin spice bread. And I got over there, and the, the thing was all gone, and no one even thought of me. It's really normal, very natural. But when you're doing like that, you're being conformed to the world. Paul had said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so the person with the renewed mind is not really preoccupied with self. Now they're interested in seeing somebody else be glorified. They want to see the other person be, be uh, receiving the honor. Uh, it happens in marriage. Paul or Peter tells the husbands, give your wives honor. He just says it straight up. Give your wife honor. Treat her honorably. She's not your property. She's not your slave. She's not your, you know, you snap your finger and put your hand out. She's supposed to fill it with whatever it is that you've trained her, you know. Well, I've got her trained. Really? That's not biblical. That's not the way the Bible says. That's the world. In the world, a woman would be treated like property. But not when you've got a renewed mind. In the renewed mind, how did Jesus treat his bride? He gave his life up for his bride. He died on the cross for his bride. So you can have a worldly mindset or you can have a new mindset. And Paul's describing it. So this would be for marriage. It would be for your children. Uh, if you, you, you can see parents trying to get the glory for their children's exploits. Right? You know, like they, you see it in, in the sports leagues or in some other kind of, a, of an achievement measurement where like, well, my kid did this. And it's like, well, this, is this really, are you honoring the kid or is, are you standing on the kid's head to get yourself a little bit higher? If, you're a, if you own a business and you're taking the credit for the hard work of the people that are working for you or whatever it, is, whatever it would be, it's all in every strata of our life, every relationship that we're in, but especially when we're together as the body. Give honor to one another, he says. I, and it's, with, it's, it's got an intensity. Several of these words have kind of a, a connotation, especially starting in the next verse. Maybe this is sort of leading up to that. But this, this has a connotation of an intensity that, that I should be more excited about the honor that would go to one of my friends than the honor that I would receive. So that's my new mind. So I want to I do that. Put others first. Show honor to one another. Give them honor. Give them glory. Give them preference. And so then verse 11, there's a, Put, I'll just put all three of these together. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So this would be, I think you could still call this, uh, you know, uh, an expression of love or how would love be defined? What does love look like? Well, love is not lagging in diligence. Listen, you'll, you can tell what kind of ice cream I like best, what kind of ice cream I love. You know how you can tell? Is if I have a bowl of it, it goes quick. I'm diligent. You can tell what kind of ice cream I don't like because I'll be picking at it. 
Oh, did you like? Oh, I really do. Yes, thank you. Taking the tiniest little bites. Diligence is a mark of love. Up early, excited, activated, moving on it. Have you seen a guy who loves to fish? You can't get the guy up any other day of the week, but fishing day, he's up so early in the morning. He's in it. If you, if you, he, won't, he, won't, he, can't, he can't work in his wife's flower bed, but you watch him take care of that bass boat. He's all over it. Diligence is a mark of love. So I think, I think this fits with the idea that if your love is without hypocrisy, we're not play acting, so what do we look like? Well, we're not lazy. I mean, the word lagging, not lagging in diligence, the New King James lagging, the word literally is laziness, slothful, uh, procrastinating. He, he says, don't be lazy. Instead, go for it. Charge. It's interesting to me about love that all of these things here that are in this list, they don't, they don't really require uh, a lot of money or a lot of giftedness. They're really more like attitudes. They're really more choices that I make. So uh, not lagging in diligence. Don't, don't be lazy. And you see your opportunity to show that family love or you see a chance to cling to what is good and give somebody else honor to show them love, man, just go for it. Uh, don't, don't be lazy, but charge. The next phrase, he says, fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit, you might just, you might just say boiling, it's boiling over in, the, in spirit. Is this Holy Spirit, capital S? Are we talking about the Holy Spirit? Are we talking about your own spirit? You can, you can probably pick one or the other or say it's both, but I think in, he's really talking about our own response, so I would say it's our spirit, that we would have passion. Not, not lazy, charging, and filled with, filled with fire. On, you know, we say that as believers, right? He's on fire. She's on fire. The best way for you to show love to the people that are around you is be on fire. Be on fire for the Lord. There's nothing, there's, there's not a blessing you can have, I think, humanly speaking, from another person. There's not, a, there's not a blessing that another person can give to you that's better than being on fire for the Lord. If you've got a friend who's just kind of walking along next to you, just cruising, it's in cruise control, they're not hot and they're not cold. They're just lukewarm. And you're trying to walk with the Lord, and you've got your lukewarm friend going along right next to you, and all of a sudden, your lukewarm friend is on fire. It's awesome, isn't it? Haven't you had that happen? You're the person that you're spending time with, and all of a sudden, you're listening, and they're, man, I was reading this verse the other day. I memorized it, and then they quote it to you. They go, then I was sick, and they're telling you about this, and like, here's my prayer list. You're not going to believe this. Look what I prayed for. And then they show you that thing, and then they tell you the other thing, and you're like, man, you're on fire. How does that make you feel? The reciprocal, one to another, right? What happens? You think, boy, I'm sure I'm glad you're my friend. I mean, I was good friends with you. I loved you. I was trying to, you know, but you were kind of lukewarm. It was kind of a drag. But, but boy, you're on fire now. It's exciting, right? It's something, it's something about the way God made us to be interacting with other people. This doesn't cost, you could say, well, I don't have any money. You don't need money to be fervent in spirit. That's free. That's just a choice. That's just deciding. That's deciding, you know what? The Lord's going to be first. You know what? I'm not going to be conformed to the world. In fact, I'm going to let my mind be transformed. I'm going to do that. That's just a choice you make. It doesn't cost you anything. Fervent in spirit, on fire for the Lord. I'm so thankful. That I remember as a new believer, I'm so thankful that uh, I was blessed. My, my formative months, the first you know, year or year and a half I was a believer, especially when I was very tempted to go back into the world, my old friends, my old lifestyle, man, I had some great friends that were so on fire for the Lord. And, and it was, even if you were, it was, you know, like the, the analogy of hot coals. You, I was, if you started to cool off, man, and you'd show up and be around these guys, you would get stoked on fire again. You know, you'd be, I'd be away, I'd be at school, and the school would, my, all my friends at school would be pouring water on my hot coal. But I'd get back with my Christian friends, my, my buddies that were walking with the Lord, and poof, you just burst into flames again. Such a blessing, such a great way to love each other. 
And then the, then the phrase, serving the Lord. This isn't a passion that's for myself. This isn't a passion for the, uh, what is it, 10 and 1 San Francisco 49ers? Aren't they 10 and 1? Are they 9 and 1? 10 and 1? Didn't they just win? Didn't they just whoop the Packers? That's for Andrea. She's, she's not here on Wednesday night, but it's for you. It's our, uh, you know, people could be passionate about all these different things. That's not, what it, that's not what he's talking about. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Looking to the Lord. It's for Jesus. This, this not lazy, but, but, but diligent, devoted, committed, uh, full of passion, full of zeal. It's for Jesus. Serving the Lord. I love that, and I like to, you know, my opinion is, and you could disagree, it's fine. My opinion, though, is, is these are all descriptions of love. And I think the best way to show that you love other people and have your love be without hypocrisy is serve the Lord. Do it for the Lord. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Well, who was that for? Well, it was for me. I was trying to get everyone to notice how awesome I am. When, it's, when service is for the Lord, it is so beautiful, it's so encouraging. It's such, it ministers so much to everybody. So uh, verse 11, these great, great exhortations. I, I put those together. Then in verse 12 to verse 13, the last list, I put those all together. These are kind of describing maybe our attitude or, or the application of our attitude in behavior. But some of these things are internalized or they're, they're experienced first in, in the heart. And the, the, verse 12, the first one, rejoicing in hope. So there's going to be a list here of these verbs. Rejoicing, patient, continuing steadfastly, distributing, and given to. And a couple of those are interesting words in the original language. But these verbs, these are, these are choices that we can make. So rejoicing in hope. That's the first one. Rejoicing in hope. Again, I could easily see this as an expression of love. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love. What's the second one? Joy. A fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit's producing love in my life. Well, what does the love look like? It's filled with joy. Um, we live in such a cynical time. We're currently having the hearings about the president and the impeachment. The country's very divided in its political camps. Um, we, have, we have the access to all this information, the information superhighway that is sort of like a super sewer highway of just of so many thoughts all the time bombarded. If you put up some kind of a comment on your Facebook, how many comments come down before you get a negative one? Or if you're on Twitter, if you, you know, it's, there's just so much um, cynicism and um, just a lack of hope in the world. But if you have a renewed mind, a loving, this is love, is to be able to have hope, rejoicing in hope. If in your family, tomorrow for Thanksgiving, if you go visit uh, your extended family and maybe you're with some people who are hopeless, you don't want to come in over the top with some kind of love that is like hypocritical, like you're putting it on, but just genuine love, just genuine, heartfelt, from the heart, from the Lord, through my heart, love going out of me, and I've got a lot of joy, and I've got a lot of hope. That's, that's a way to be loving to people, is to bring hope to them. When someone's discouraged, not to be Job's comforter, you don't want to be, you don't want to be that where you look at them and go, what did you do? Why is this bad stuff happening? It must be your fault. But to, you know, even if you're sitting with someone, weep with those who weep, but, but to be able to bring some kind of a blessing, a perspective or some hopefulness to them. You say, you know what? I, mean, I don't know how, what's going to happen with this. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. But I have hope. I have hope that God's going to be able to work. And so we'll just be praying for you. We love you. And if there's a way we can help. Please don't hesitate to ask. But, but even if you've lost hope, we haven't lost hope. What a, what a, what a wonderful way to show love to somebody. Uh, hope. Rejoicing in hope. Uh, he'll say in a minute, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep in, in verse 15. That's not in a minute. We'll get to it next week. But in the context, it's in a minute. So this idea is, is some way that we connect with each other. But, but here, just in the attitude of the heart. 
There, there's nothing more discouraging than talking to a Christian who's lost all hope and you're, you're kind of struggling with your hope, like you're on the thin ice and you can hear it cracking. One of your legs is already wet and you're about to go down and you sort of throw your rope out to your believing friend and they just throw it back and go, you might as well just drown. You know, it's all bad. <sighs> a hopeless, discouraged believer. Don't be that. Put this into practice in your life. Rejoice in hope. And then patient in tribulation. This is another way, uh, I think, to show love. It, it is, is just, it's just in your own clinging to what is good, your own character, what God's doing in your life is a patience. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's a mark of the Spirit. And if you look at the fruit of the Spirit as it's all love and then the rest, you know, fruit singular, not fruits plural, then there's a list of nine. But it's fruit singular, so a lot of people think, well, it's love as one, and then the other eight are pointing back at, at what love looks like. Well, here it is. Patient in tribulation. I think in my life, some of the people who've had the biggest impact on me are the older believers who had gone through many tribulations and who learned patience. And when I was a new believer, a younger believer, or, or a believer from yesterday or whatever, and you're with somebody and they've walked with the Lord, and their gift of love to me is their patience. And you, you, they hear your story, they listen, they go, well, you just hang in there. You can hang in there. Hang in there a little while longer. We'll be praying for you. Just, they, they, they've lived it. When someone's lived it and they've experienced it, and they're not saying it out of uh, a lack of knowledge, or it's not their ignorance, it's that, well, we lost a baby also. Or... or you know, we, we, you know, my wife died, and, and, and now my second wife has cancer. Um, or, you know, I lost two businesses, and then this happened. And when, when they're a seasoned saint, they've gone through the hardships. They're patient in tribulation. That ministry of, of love in that character trait is better than money. There's sometimes you, money won't solve your problem because the problem is your heart, right? Like God's allowing you to have a trial because the problem is your heart, and if he just gave you the money, you'd still have the dumb heart. You wouldn't have the problem. He wants you to have the problem and have your heart change. He's going to use the problem as a tool. And so just rescuing you out of the problem is not going to help because I'm the problem, right? I need to change. So God's allowing me to have a trial. It's showing me. So when I have a believer who's patient in tribulation or who's rejoicing in hope, who can show love to me through that the experience that they've had, you can't put a price tag on it. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't measure it. I remember when Gina and I were, <clears throat> we were newly married. We, I had already started working at Calvary Chapel as a janitor, and we were trying to move from North Orange County down by the beach, and the prices for rent were ridiculous, and I made $5 an hour, <laughs> and, uh, and it was not looking like we were, we were going to start a dumpster ministry behind the supermarket where we were going to move into a double-wide dumpster. I don't know. It was, we were expecting our first baby. And I remember going to Romaine and asking him for prayer one night after a Bible study and, uh, and kind of said, hey, we're having a hard time finding a place. And he goes, let me pray for you. He put his hands on us, and he prayed a really short prayer. But one of the things, he, the only thing I really remember he said was, Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd bless these two above and beyond what they could ask or think. I was thinking way below what I could ask. I, like anything is like, just give us anything, Lord. And he prayed like a top shelf prayer. Lord, I pray that, they would, that you would bless them with a place that would be above and beyond what they could ask or think. It was his faith. It was his patience in tribulation. It was his rejoicing and hope. We didn't have any. We'd already put out all the applications. We'd visited every place. And everybody said, Really? You're serious? Sorry, this isn't for you. Uh, the places that we did find, you, um, you kind of had to be in a gang to live there or be selling drugs uh, for the gang. So, I mean, it was, it was, it was hit and miss. So, and I remember when we finally found the place where the Lord, that the Lord had us live, it was a mile from the ocean, had all these big open windows, that we had very, just all this natural light, and... Uh, the guy, didn't, I, the guy said, well, how much do you make? And I told him, he goes, great. And he, he goes, this is, the, this is how much you need. And my grandma had just given me some money for graduation. It was the exact amount that he needed for the deposit. And he just handed me the key. And I said, that's it? And he goes, yeah, you can move in tomorrow. I was like, good, because we have to move out of the other place tomorrow. The day we had to move out. 
And the Lord totally did it. And it was above and beyond what we could ask or think. I can honestly say, and Gina is my witness, we did not have the faith for that. It wasn't, we, were not, we weren't riding on fumes. Our tank was empty. We were riding on somebody else's fumes. I mean, somebody, it was, you know, somebody else rejoicing in hope, somebody else patient in tribulation, and they were showing love to us by coming alongside of us in our difficulty with their hope and with their patience and showing love to us. That's happened to us many, many times in our lives. Patient in tribulation and also continuing steadfastly in prayer. Persistent is the word continuing steadfastly. The idea, this is the same thing that Jesus taught, shameless persistence in prayer. Which of you has a friend who comes at midnight and says, my family's coming for Thanksgiving tomorrow and I don't have a turkey. And I, I know you have three. You know, give me the turkey. Get away. You know, I, my kids are asleep. I need a turkey. <laughs> Tomorrow's Thanksgiving and I'm not prepared. And I know you have an extra one. Just get out of here, man. I'm not leaving. All right, all right, all right, already. Jesus told the story, right? Right? He said, the guy won't get up because he's his friend, but because he won't stop knocking, he'll do it. And Jesus said, that's how you pray. That's how you pray. Now, does that mean God is in heaven and he's like, quit bothering me? No, no. It's a contrast. But it's pointing out our attitude. God is awesome. He's ready to give. I don't always understand the timing. I cannot give up in prayer. I have to be shamelessly persistent in prayer. And that's what Paul's saying here. Do you think of that as an expression of love? If I said the number one thing I would be most happy about, if you want to show love to me, would be love God and do what he says. You know what would be number two? This one. Persistent in prayer. The thing that I need from you more than anything else you could do for me was be pray. Pray for me. Pray for the ministry. Pray for the congregation. Pray for our outreach in the community. Pray for the Sacramento County. Pray for downtown. Pray for Elk Grove. Pray. Pray, 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 pray. If that's more than money. It's more than anything. So these are expressions of love, I think, that, that continuing steadfastly in prayer, it's the best way. If you have a friend and you want to show them love, just, just say, I'm going to give you a gift for Christmas. I'm going to pray for you every single day in 2020. That's your Christmas present. Now, if they're lukewarm, they might go, great, thanks. I mean, you know, they may not care. But pray for them to be on fire. Rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continued steadfastly in prayer. Verse 13, we can finish up here in the next minute or two. He's, this says distributing to the needs of the saints. You know the word distributing? You know it. It's a Greek word that you've heard. It's the Greek word koinonia. Right? That's translated most of the time koinonia is translated as fellowship. It literally means to share. So if you were taking that word koinonia, what does it mean? It's, have, it's koinonia, it's the verb, koinonia towards the needs of the saints. What does it mean? It means share. You see somebody, share what you have with somebody else. Now that's a great way to show love. Share. You say, you know what, I have this thing, haven't been using it that much, I know this person, they, could really lo they would really love this, I'm just going to share it with them. Now, we want to be careful about this because this is a certain kind of communism. It's not the kind of communism that the government tells you you have to do. <laughs> this is the kind of communism that you get to decide yourself. It's free will communism. This isn't, hey, I just got elected and all y'all need to share with me. Why don't you guys all give it to me and would you share with me and then I'll decide who gets what. All right, we could have an argument about government and forms of government if you want, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches this, which is you decide. You make a decision. How much, how much do you have that you can share with other people? And share with people. Just share with them. Share with those saints. This isn't talking about our outreach ministry. This is talking about our ministry to ourselves and within the congregation. Distribute to the needs of the saints. You see believers who are in need, um, then share with them. And then the last one, I said there, was, there were the three, three uh, times in, in this section that used the word philos or brotherly love. Two are in verse 10, and the last one's in verse 13. This given to hospitality is one word. Or, well, actually, it's two words. 
There's, there's the action word of the given, which, which is a very, very strong word, and it means to sort of press or force, or it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a really uh, kind of a, like a salesman that won't take no for an answer at your front door or puts his foot in the door. Like this is a, it's kind of an aggressive word. And then it, the word for hospitality is the word literally is philos, love. And then the word xenos for strangers. The word hospitality means love strangers. So when you see someone strange or you see someone stranger, the Bible says love them. Now, we generally look at people and we decide by how they look whether or not we're going to interact with them. We look and we see their crazy eyes or we see their hair is kind of weird looking or you, they walk in and you say, I have not seen a hairstyle like that since 1974. Or the, you look at their clothes, or you see the car that they drive, or you see something, or you're perceiving something about them. That stranger thing, it's all the, the sociological impact of that for people and how we relate to each other. When it comes to the new mind in the world, don't be conformed. In the world, they look and go, what color are they wearing? Is that red or blue? What what nationality are they? What tribe are they? What is this? And then we faction ourselves out, and then there, it could be to the death. You could have a, immediately an observation and go, that person, I can tell by their tribal scars, they're from the other tribe, we're at war with them, kill them right now. Or you could say, that guy's got a red bandana, we're blue bandanas, we're gonna, I'm going to shoot that guy right now. You could just decide in a second. That's the world. Don't be conformed to the world. The new mind says, when I see somebody that looks like they're not part of my tribe, I go over there and I treat them like a brother. Phileo. Phileo, the stranger. The stranger is my brother. Isn't that awesome? You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are now commanded by God to be brothers to everybody that you meet. Hey, bro, you're not my bro. Actually, I am. You may, you may not receive me as your brother, but guess what? I am your brother because Jesus commanded me to love you. Now, you look strange to me. In fact, you look quite like a stranger, and the more you talk, the stranger you get. No, you don't say that, but the idea in the world, and then you can see, you can, listen, do an experiment. Watch people walk in on a Sunday morning in our congregation. Stand at the wall and watch and look and go, that person looks stranger. That looks like a stranger, and watch what everybody does to him. You'll watch a large percentage of the congregation turn and look and go, oh, I haven't seen anybody like that before. What's that? Maybe even a double take, triple take. But no, no, no brotherliness, no brotherly happening, only stranger. Have you been the brunt of that? Have you been the recipient of that? Have you walked into a, a group of Christians and they all, they're in a circle talking and they all turn and look at you and then they all turn back? It's a great feeling, isn't it? It makes you feel so like a stranger. Make people feel like a brother. And I love it because the other word, um, verse 13, the word translated as given, it, this is the word given like, uh, you know, I don't know, like a piranha is given to, you know, an animal that falls in the water. Like this is a give. This isn't like I choose to or I don't choose to. No, this is, a, this is aggressively pursuing, chasing, totally committed to this thing. To what? to making strangers feel like brothers. So this list, tremendous. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Don't, we're not pretending to do this. We're doing it from our heart. So what are we doing? Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, and honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, and given to hospitality. I think he keeps talking about love because look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse. So we'll, it's kind of part two next time, but I think it's this, all, this whole little section you could all put it under the category of love. But these verses are very powerful. Father, help us to to put them into practice. We don't want to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Hearing it, Lord, and then letting it speak to us, letting your word sort of awaken us to maybe areas we've let go dormant or, or die maybe, or the fire's gone out, 
Lord, that you'd rekindle a fire of diligence so we wouldn't be lazy. You'd rekindle a fire of love of strangers, that you would stir up in us a passion to hate what is evil and then cling to what is good. Lord, all these things are so, they're so, I wouldn't say easy to do, but Lord, they don't, they don't require a lot of startup costs. These are the kind of things that, oh, if I just change my attitude, I could do this right away. So, Lord, change our attitude, change our minds, help us to have renewed minds so we can see the good and acceptable, the perfect will of God as we give you our lives. We pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.